Music is an interesting thing. I started off, I suppose, about the age of four. My sister got me a tape recorder and an old microphone which you could just plug in normally to those days to a, an answer machine. And I plugged it in and from that moment I was hooked. And it wasn't long before I was getting all of my dad's records, whether it be Simon on Garfunkel and picking up some of the uh, John Denver tracks and putting them on along with Mungo Jerry and just trying to learn how to use the 33 and a third and 45 on the turntables and start making, you know, I suppose amateur radio programmes. And back then, you know, the old fashioned thing of taping the top 40 and pretending that you were in it. Music was always something which kind of surrounded me. And at the same time, around about the age of about five, six years old, um, I went off for music lessons, so I think I got bought a keyboard from an airport. It was one of these things that you could only play one note at a time on. <laughs> and I was just absolutely hooked. I loved the demo programs, I loved the whole kind of rhythm sections that would go along with it. So really from that early age, I was you know, growing up always surrounded by music, the various forms of it, whether it be creating it, and there it is, you know, on a £7.99 keyboard, all the way through to, right, you've got vinyls, you've got tapes, ultimately uh, mini discs, MP3, CDs, and you know, it pretty much evolved with me as, as I grew up, so music was always there and always something which inspired me. I think the first track that really inspired me was Swamp Thing by The Grid. It was the first time I'd ever seen music taken out of the ability of playing it live and linking it up with some technology and all of a sudden you've got uh, something which you couldn't possibly play live uh, and it's the technology playing it and to me that was fascinating because it was something that I couldn't do. Um, I remember my dad got really influenced by watching the clothes show and switching it on and there was the Pet Shop Boys doing In The Night and some electronic music and I remember them watching you know, Neil Tennant um, and, and, and Chris on the keyboards just kind of layering and layering and I was just blown away as someone now who had been learning keyboards for like five or six years and how on earth is this man replicating an orchestra and he's just got a vocalist with him so that was a real turning point for me but no one around me thought it was cool at the age of like 10, 11, 12 years old to be liking the, the sound of the Pet Shop Boys so they then got into things like Too Unlimited by No Limit and he started listening to some of those tracks The Prodigy, the early parts of and so, so we're in that really kind of what we call now old school with a K uh, dance music from the early 90s and you would pick up the phone and you'd be ringing your friend and you'd be spending hours on the phone holding the phone next to the speaker saying listen to this and your mates would be doing exactly the same so yeah it's really great that here I am age 31 now I don't have to hold the phone next to a speaker <laughs> I can just press play and get people to dance or press play and people hear it on the radio so it's still doing the same thing but to a lot you know wider audience. Was there any bands or anything like that? Yeah that? I, was in, I was in bands when I was at school and naturally as a keyboard player the first thing I wanted to do was find someone who could play the guitar very loud um, and I formed a, a succession of bands which uh, culminated in one which I was very happy with called Adrenaline Rush and I was the main songwriter and the other people would just come along they didn't really know much about music so you know they pretty much taught themselves in a couple of weeks how to play drums and how to sing and there was like no musical theory there so I'd always say well what we're gonna do it's got to be sounding like this and I don't know just play some notes or let, let me have a look and, and I'd almost be orchestrating it in those early days and it was a racket, a racket, it was very raucous, but at the same time the passion was there and um, you know there was a lot of rock and then there was a lot of other bands around school doing the same sort of thing and off we went, we used to play at nursing homes for the school, we used to play in uh, church vicarages and everything like this, so you know music was always there, always a variety of styles and you know once you started going off into a band you find that sometimes what you're playing in a band is not what you're listening to. Yeah. You finally get the chance to come out of school uniform and all of a sudden it's like what on earth do you wear? And all of a sudden you start seeing the goth kids, you know, gelling their hair black and buying trench coats and getting face makeup and then people go down to the tattoo parlour and get themselves all linked up. Uh, for me it was a kind of a case of, you know, go and get yourself a crisp shirt, get an iron and, you know, you're going to start going out and you're going to start hitting the town and going into clubs and, and go on to chase, you know, music and girls at that particular age. And, you know, I think everyone had their own niche of which direction they were heading in. 
and it was really easy to be sucked in any of those directions but also it was really easy to feel very alienated from all of those other people in those groups and it's not till you get later in life till you realise quite how segregated those, those groups are. I went to my first club way way too young as what I should be and I remember the bouncers saying to me on the door as long as you don't cause any trouble I'll let you in and I remember going in and at that time tracks like Live in Joy with Dreamer was being played it was Alex Party, Don't Give Me Your Life and um, Rhythm is a Dancer by Snaps so all of these huge 1990s anthems and then it was always finishing with um, Faithless Insomnia and tracks like this and Entrance Set You Free and it was a it was a, a time where you know all of a sudden those people who discovered synthesizers and computers had found actually a purpose and a niche in the market but at the same time they'd be dropping it in with tracks like Cotton Eye Joe by Rednecks and there'd be the odd Steps track and S Club 7 uh, being dropped in and you're like what this doesn't work with Entrance set you free and it'd, you know, it'd either drive you to the dance floor or drive you back to the bar so you were finding out every two or three songs you know you were trying kind of making the opposite trip and I remember going from a club in Hereford of about 140, 150 people and eventually my mate ringing me up and by that stage I was already DJing virtually every weekend so I didn't get the chance to go out to any big clubs or get in my car at that stage and go to any clubs across the region and I remember him saying to me, do you fancy going to Ibiza? And the one Saturday I was in a club of about 120, 130 people and the following Saturday I was in a club with 10,500. And what was that like? And that was just epic. Um, it was S Paradise. It was a fully marble club. And you walked in, and just as you walked in, you felt that you'd walked into this place which was paradise with palm trees growing up in the middle and ivy up the side of the nightclubs and massive drape and like a huge UFO in the centre of the dance floor which landed and people would get on there and it'd take them, it would zap them up and they'd be dancing in this cage, you know absolutely up, there were speakers everywhere, there were household name DJs everywhere you looked, you know, it was full of glamour and beauty and you were just blown away with how things could sound great. Songs which you'd heard in a nightclub of 120 people sounded alright but you put it onto a sound system which they'd, I remember reading in a paper, they just had refitted it for the season of a, an extra 5.5 million pound refurb for just their sound system and hearing your favourite songs at that particular time on just the biggest sound system you're ever going to hear it on in one of the biggest nightclubs of 10,500 people just made it euphoric. If you walk into uh, next door to West Paradise is where Judge Jules was doing his Judgment Sundays at a place called Eden and you'd walk in at about half three in the morning, it would start to rain in the nightclub um, and it would carry on raining until you know, you're up to your neck in, in water and then they switch the phone machines on and just everyone would disappear <laughs> and it was just something that you'd never ever witnessed before. Always remember the song that was playing when that phone machine, it was a track called Galaxia by Moon Man, the first time I'd ever witnessed a phone machine. And I remember going to a similar party and it was a, a popcorn party and they just made the dance floor disappear by filling it up with popcorn. And you can always remember, and it's something which I've always taken with me, is you can always remember the first time you heard a song. And then I also went through the period of, I had all of these tapes, I had all of these vinyls, I had all the stuff that I was listening to. Um, how do I make it ultra portable? So I was then putting it onto mini discs. And then from there on, I then found a, a built myself a computer that I was able to burn mini discs from. So, um, which was groundbreaking at the time. Um, and it was, you know, the first version of a USB thing that was burning, you, uh, you know, your mini discs from a computer. And I was thinking, what, what am I messing around with? I might as well burn myself CDs. But CDs were getting trashed. It was before the smoking ban. Um, you know, you'd open up your CD collections, there'd be 35 discs a week ruined by smoke and tobacco, which was just, you know, a film over the top of your, your discs. And in the end I thought, well, you've got all of this digitised, take it out on a computer and you've always got a backup at home. So, you know, I'd always collected music and I always had it in virtually every form going. Oh, did you have a decent hi-fi? It sounds like you would have to have a decent hi-fi with the way you're talking. I had my dad's various stacking systems, so at the bottom was a really old clunky amp with a proper loud button which you know pulled in all the bass and all the treble and it was the old tuner with the long wave and the medium wave and the FM and this little kind of 
twirled up aerial, which, you know, you try and drop down the back, but it could never pick anything up. So the best thing you could do is just pin it to the wall. <laughs> and it didn't matter what station you listened to, you always needed to listen, to, uh, you know, move the aerial. Above that, your VU meters on, you know, proper retro tape player. Absolutely loved that. I can't remember the, the make of it, but it was some. I was a Wharfdale uh, on a really great, you know, tape with Dolby surround sound on it. Um, and, you know, on, and at that early stage, I was after the best sound, and I was going through the ferric tapes, the chrome tapes, and just trying to find what would give you the best sound. On top of that was uh, a turntable, and I always learnt that, yeah, if you bring it back by a quarter of a turn, if you pressed on, it would take that quarter of a turn for the record to get to speed. So you could, if you're going to record something, you could press on and record at that kind of speed and it would capture it perfectly. There wouldn't be any wind-up sound, there wouldn't be any crackles, but the only problem with pulling it back a quarter of a turn, it was a belt drive, so the belt would slip off. So you'd be <coughs> lifting off and forever taking this thing to bits, and then in the end, I think you're kind of holding it together with elastic bands, because the amount of time you put it back on, and now it's 20 years old, you know, the rubber's just gone and cracked. What makes a, a good DJ compared with a bad DJ? So you're, let's stay in Ibiza at the moment, and you yeah. judge Jules, Fantastic. What makes him fantastic compared with somebody who might be doing a club in Birmingham or something? I suppose it's all about feeling and just being able to be at one with your audience. And you go along to a night of someone like Judge Jules or Dave Pierce or Lisa Lashes, and you know what they're go you're going to get because they're so true to their music style. They're so passionate about what they play, and it's the ability to have trust and I think that if you've heard five great songs in a row and something comes on a bit iffy as song number six you should know that actually the last five were pretty damn good I reckon this is going somewhere I'm gonna stay on this dance floor because this is gonna be epic and the chances are it's going to be and I think that you know the difference between a bad DJ and a good DJ is not only a person who can read a crowd but also a person who can be uh, able to make the crowd like putty in their hands, you know, the ability to walk up to a pair of record decks and say, they're not going to dance to this one, that group over there are going to dance to that, and then we're going to get them all up with that, but I'm going to keep them up for three songs, there's absolutely no way I can sustain keeping everybody up because people are going to get tired, so on and so forth, so we're going to lose that group, but these people are going to think you're God, these people are going to think actually this isn't really for me but before they have a chance to go home you're going to bring them back and they're going to replace the people already on the floor so you can almost play like a musical dominoes almost with with your crowd as to who you're going to bring up who you're going to sit down and keep swapping them around and hopefully you know by the end of that night um, all of those people have gone home feeling that 75% or more has been for them